Once your blood runs orange and blue, orange and blue. 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 this, this is, the pod, is the pod for you. For you. You're listening to Orange and Blue Bloods, hosted by EJ Stewart and Tommy Beer. Let's get to it, New York. The Knicks and Heat are tied 1-1. The series heads to South Beach for his game for games three and four. And joining us to provide a Miami perspective on the series is Alex Dono. He co-hosts the Red Hot Hoops Miami Heat podcast for the Odyssey Sports Network. He also does great work covering all things Miami sports, including my beloved Miami Hurricanes, something I probably mentioned a couple of times briefly on this podcast for a Locked On Canes. Alex, thank you so much for joining us. Me and Tommy really appreciate it. Yeah, EJ and Tommy, thanks for having me. And I'm just glad we can be enemies again, right? Because I, <laughs> man, I came up in the late 90s. I mean, I, I was born in the 80s, but what really cemented my love for basketball was the Heat Knicks rivalry in the late 90s and Pat Riley being such a huge part of that, the whole Pat the Rat thing. And that's yeah. the guy who was the architect of the Miami Heat that we know today and I, I've always been looking to rekindle that rivalry and you know I said it before this series started I, I thought this was going to be a seven game type of series and every game going to be close coming down to the wire and that's that's the way it's played out these first couple of games so I, I think uh, I, th- I think we'll be uh, we'll be seeing a lot of each other for uh, for the next little bit here because I think we're probably going to get five more games of this the, the world is a better place when the Heat and Nick fans hate each other you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have loved the kind of loved the trash talk from Heat fans. I gotta admit, like I feel like I don't know, I feel like the LeBron era, I don't want to say softened you guys, but I feel like it was like so easy the championships they came and then and you guys came out of that with such a really solid squad. It was almost like you guys kind of became like just kind of the establishment of the NBA. I re- you guys didn't have any rivalry, so we really didn't see a lot of trash talk from Heat fans as much, but I feel like this series. Has really re- revived that, and I've seen so much on the timeline. So uh, yeah, it's been it's been good f- vibes. Feels a lot like the late nineties with the trash talk on the fans. Maybe not the physical play on the court, but the the the, the, the he beef with the fans is still real. Well, and I'll add something to that, EJ, because there's you know just based on the generational thing, there's you know a lot of younger Heat fans who don't really remember a whole lot before the Big Three era, right? I mean, is and I'm I'm an old man in my late thirties, but I, I know enough Heat fans in their twenties who it kind of started for them in the Big Three, or if not, it maybe yeah. started for them in two thousand six with Dwayne Wade winning that championship. But I think that this series and the way that ESPN and TNT are milking it with some of that old footage. Right. Some of the old footage from the late 90s. And it's kind of causing a lot of young fans to kind of dig a little bit deeper into the archives and learn what this was all about. So I'm all for it. Yeah, it's been great to see some of the old Knicks. I kind of want to see some old heat. I want to see them. Dan Marley. uh, I don't know. uh, Sean Leonard. I don't know where he's at. Uh, You know, uh, if they can get some of these guys in there uh, in in the building for these uh, games three and game four, that'd be awesome. So uh, we're two games in. Series is tied. I got to ask you from the heat perspective, how is Heat Nation feeling? being tied 1-1, going back to South Beach? Um, I think that there is a little bit of what I feel is an overreaction in an optimism sense, Mm. thinking, because I'll I'll say this, guys. um, We've all been doing this for way too long to think that one game can define an entire series. Like, every game, every matchup is going to be different. So I find that the attitude of a lot of Heat fans is, hey, it's, it's kind of okay that... Butler didn't play in game two and the Heat lost game two because they they stole back home court advantage and look how competitive they were without Jimmy and without Tyler and hey, they were really competitive in game two. I didn't think yeah. they were going to be when I found out Jimmy didn't play. But I think there's an overconfidence that comes from that in thinking that, hey, this team led most of the game and it didn't really get away from them until around the final five, five and a half minutes without having a superstar on the floor. So that means, assuming Butler comes back game three and beyond, people feel like this is going to be really easy. Got their split in New York. Jimmy's going to be back. They're going to have no problem. To me, every single game tells a different story, guys. And, like, you know, the Heat, uh, the, you know, they, they took game one in a game where the Knicks shot uncharacteristically poorly from three. I think that had a lot to do with it. And, uh, you know, the Knicks did what they had to do in game two with their season on the line. And guess what? If if the Knicks can get a split in South Florida, they can take home court advantage right back. So, honestly, I think in in Butler not playing in game two and I, you know, 
Spo said that it wasn't gamesmanship, trusting our medical staff. They made the decision for Jimmy that he shouldn't play. Uh, still, with him not playing, I, I felt like the Heat surrendered that second game. But if, mm. if they could have won that game and taken a 2-0 lead, then I'm thinking Heat in five or six, right? But since they split those first two games, now I'm thinking it's probably going to end up in a game seven and then winning a game seven at MSG. Not impossible for the Heat, but going to be really, really difficult. So that's kind of the way I'm looking at this. I think this is going to come down to the wire because the Heat couldn't quite close that game out in game two. I agree with you. That could be a game that they look back on. Uh, Alex, but just circling, we'll get to Jimmy Butler and his availability for game three and how the Heat adjusts one with the other. But um, just kind of big picture, obviously Heat didn't play up to expectations during the regular season, kind of staggered into the postseason, got there, and then looked like a different team, highest scoring team in the first round, led the league in offensive efficiency um, against a quality Bucks team who most people, including myself, thought would win the championship this season. Um, was it as simple as them flipping the switch? Was there some other stuff going on that just kind of took time to kind of figure out? Or what was your – what's been the difference between kind of the playoff heat and the regular season heat thus far? Yeah, there was a lot of stuff. Um, now, one person who can flip that switch is Butler. He just mm – -hmm. he he cares so much more in the playoffs guys. I mean, in a lot of these regular season games, you know, he's, he's in his thirties with a lot of mileage. Cause he, you know, he played all those years under Tom Thibodeau who kind of sucked all the, all the life out of him for a long time. Oh, yeah. uh, and, and so, uh, you know, Jimmy, Jimmy conserves himself during the regular season and in a lot of regular season games, he just doesn't really decide to kind of turn it on until the fourth quarter where in the playoffs, he, he pretends everything is the fourth quarter. So that's one, but for everything else, you know, for the Heat having such a disappointing regular season and just like barely sneaking into the playoffs, a lot of it just had to do with um, terrible, terrible injury bug. Um, it was it was biting the team throughout the year. I do think Eric Spolstra, he's kind of this masochist where he kind of likes having to play all these undrafted guys because like, I don't know, he's like a mad scientist. So I think he kind of enjoys it. I don't think Riley in the front office enjoy having so many guys out throughout the year. Um, you know, when they when they made that uh, those trades and those deals to acquire uh, Kevin Love specifically and Cody Zeller, it took them a long time to gel. And they experimented with K Love in a number of different ways to find his role. Started out as a starter, then ended up being a bench guy. But now sometimes he has to start depending on who's in and who's out of the lineup. So everything was just really, really herky jerky throughout the regular season. And I I think under. Butler's uh, leadership, specifically through that Milwaukee series where he was playing out of his mind. Uh, I just think the way he played just kind of inspired everybody else to fall in line. And you even mm -hmm. saw that in in game one when he rolled the ankle and he stayed in and couldn't really move around a whole lot. Just him being out there, I think, had had an effect on on lifting his teammates down the stretch of that game. So it was the, the regular season was almost like a throwaway because, you know, you end up sneaking in through the play in, but then you knock out the number one seed in the first round. So everything just kind of outside of the fact you're not going to have any home court advantage the rest of the way. That's unfortunate. But outside of that, the seeding doesn't even really matter anymore. The, the regular season was just like it was like a training session. It was like you were running on a treadmill for 82 games. Yeah, and to Jimmy Butler's credit, and we kind of poked fun at him all season, but he talked about, you know, saying, oh, I'll play serious when it's time to play serious. And, you know, it took the fourth quarter of a playing game, <laughs> last game elimination against the Bulls, I guess, to, to pull it out. But then since then, the Heat, whole, their whole team has looked like an entirely different team. So credit to Butler. But as we talk about Jimmy, and you go beyond this game, game two, where he doesn't play, you have, you know, now for him, almost a week layoff before – game one to game three so plenty of time to potentially get ready how confident are you that he'll be able to get back to being the jimmy butler we saw in the milwaukee series and if he's not how confident are the heat abilities to kind of mask that and find a way to still come up with the series if jimmy butler is indeed 50 to 75 percent of what he normally is yeah like on the one hand the ankle roll looked really bad in live time and his reaction to it but there, there was uh, pretty quick proclamations after the game that, hey, it's not as serious as it looks. And then, you know, the, the next day I see him, he's out on Fifth Avenue shopping, you know, wearing a, a fanny pack. And I thought, oh, OK, so he's going to play game two. And then he was a, a late scratch in game two. I, you know, I, I mentioned that they, they defaulted to the medical staff on him, but I can't help but feel that if the Heat were down 0-1 and not up 1-0, 
I think he would have played in game two. So I, I, I think that they were being a little bit cautious and they kind of punted that game thinking, you know, we can get him five days off in between games, get him back home to South Florida. Um, I, I can't say with a hundred percent certainty, but I think he's going to be pretty close to himself when he comes back all that extra rest. And, you know, he's basically the entire time he's been in a heat uniform. He's always been playing through minor injuries. If it's not ankles, it's been knees. You know, he's basically been on a maintenance program for the last three years. So he's, he's always been able to kind of zone some of that stuff out when the lights are brightest. I think it's going to be one of those things where by the time this heat playoff run is over, whether it's in this series or, you know, in, into the, NBA championship Jimmy's just going to basically spend like two weeks straight in the cold tub just like soaking all of his uh, his issues because he's been playing through a lot of stuff so I I think we're going to get pretty close to the best version of Butler by the time he comes back uh two games into the series now you've had an up close look at the Knickerbockers uh just curious as a you know kind of an outside look in um your thoughts maybe some expectations you had of the club um prior to these first two games of series versus kind of what you've seen is there anything that's kind of stood out or surprised you thus far uh hartenstein is an absolute pest and this guy is like uh, he's one of those i'm um, like I, I i would love him in a heat uniform like he annoys you in any other uniform but he does so many of those little things and he gave bam so many problems so you know to have to have a role player like that is big uh, you know, Randall is, is he gets healthier. Uh, you know, obviously he he killed the heat in one of those regular season games with a game winner. He, he's a thorn in anybody's side, especially in Miami's side. Uh, super impressed by what Hart does on both ends of the floor. And I'm just impressed overall at Jalen Brunson. I mean, that's going to be he, he's the type of player, you know budding superstar type of guy where whoever wins the series, if the heat win the series, you're going to look back and probably Butler's going to have to be the MVP of the series for Miami. If the Knicks win the series, Jalen Brunson is going to be the guy who's got to lift that team uh, on their shoulders. And I I think overall fellas um, from top to bottom, uh, this is the best version of the New York Knicks I've seen in a long time. Uh, and I, I think that they are, they're the deeper overall basketball team, especially with the heat, not having, Tyler Hero because you know he can kind of be that number two scoring option behind Jimmy so I think the Knicks definitely have like the better overall team you know I, I think Butler's the guy who's you know is what we saw in that Bucks series he's got the highest ceiling if he's on so if the Heat win the series it's probably because they've got you know one of the hottest players in the playoffs right now or if if the Knicks can just keep playing team ball uh, they could end up being the guys who prevail here. Wow and then on that same note regarding what you've seen from the Knicks, I'm curious having now watched this series and even maybe some of the regular season, what are you surprised about or what has stood out to you from what the Heat have been able to do to the Knicks that maybe you didn't expect to see coming into this series in terms of the success they've had? Yeah, well, I, I, I'll definitely say coming out of game two, uh, the success that Miami's undrafted mob has had in this series uh, I think they combined for like either 71 or 74 points undrafted players in game two um, I, I thought maybe uh, the first two games would be a little bit more low scoring than they were you know I can remember on our most recent episode of Red Hot Hoops uh, we were looking at the the total in game two and it was uh, it, I'm sure it changed once Jimmy was ruled out but like in the early afternoon yesterday it was 208 and I'm like oh, I think it's probably going to creep over 208 uh, my mm-hmm. co-host Hollywood was like, no, nah, I think it's going to be under 208, like 1990 style type of game. But mm-hmm. they they went way over that total. So I, I think that surprised me a little bit because these are these are both strong defensive teams. And in the case of Miami, uh, they didn't really start scoring over 100 points per game consistently till the playoffs. Like the regular season, they were playing 90s ball <laughs> most of the way. <laughs> they, they were, you know, when they were losing games, they were in the 90s. When they were winning games, they were scoring like 102 so, you know, wow. I think that the uh, just the success that Miami had from, you know, Gabe Vincent and, you know, his 21 points, Caleb Martin, his 22 points in game two. I think one of the things, guys, that we could probably get a little bit more into this that was a little bit of an unpleasant surprise from a Miami standpoint. And this has been annoying me since last night. How is it in a game when Jimmy sits out, Bam Adebayo can't put up more than 10 shots? Yeah. Can't put up more than 10 shots. Like, come on, man. Uh, you know, he he affects the game in a lot of other ways. He's a really good passing big man, six assists. But when you've got no Jimmy and you obviously have no Tyler Hero, who's usually the second scoring option, 
Uh, you know, even if you ha- didn't have a great shooting night, if Bam is trying a lot of like long range jumpers, you got to try more than 10 shots in the game. I and, and he, you know, he copped to it afterwards. He he put the loss on himself and all that. But uh, I, I thought, guys, it was a no brainer when when Jimmy was ruled out. I'm thinking win or lose. Bam's got to put up at least 15, 20 shots and they need, you know, yeah. 25 points from Adebayo, something like that. And he just didn't have enough. Yeah, the, the Knicks game plan all season under Tibbs has been kind of wall off the paint and force guys to shoot from the outside. So from from a New York perspective, the thinking was, you know, I think a lot of fans were worried that they'd give up too many open looks. And um, actually, the Heat taking 49 three-pointers was the most three-pointers the Knicks have ever allowed, uh, most attempts the Knicks have ever allowed in a postseason game in franchise history. And the 17 makes are the most they've ever allowed as well. So um, I think Knicks fans are worried about that. Um, uh, but I, I agree with you, um, you know, and to Bam's credit, he did take responsibility, um, you know, for for not probably not producing as, as much as Heat fans would have hoped. Um, last one for me, just kind of, um, you know, you, you've talked about kind of the contributors, the undrafted free agent gang. Um, when Hero went down in game one against Milwaukee, I think the thought was, OK, this is a low scoring team. And now they're really going to struggle to score missing, you know, their second or third, you know, best offensive option. So how has the you know, we've kind of gotten a, a look at it now. Vincent has hit some big shots and and Kevin Love. Is that just basically the idea is just to spread the wealth even even further? And that's actually opened up some more scoring opportunities for Butler and other guys. Um, but how has the loss of Hero kind of impacted the, the team over these last couple? Well, I think what you just described is plan B. I think plan A has just been Jimmy's got to score basically enough points for he and Tyler's averages. I think I think that was mm-hmm. kind of plan A. Uh, but you yeah. know, but the plan B part, so, something kind of kind of interesting uh, without Tyler uh, and even without Jimmy. I'm not saying they don't miss these guys. Believe me, they do. But the, the ball was moving really yeah. well for most of that game, like Absolutely. that. So that and, and that's why I say that Spo is a little bit sadistic and that Eric Spolster kind of likes when he's got to coach these underdogs. Because I think that's when you really see Spolstra basketball, like nothing in isolation. Uh, you know, he's got plays drawn up for everything and the ball never stops moving. So uh, I think we saw a lot of that. But then the problem is you get down to closing time, you get down to the final five minutes and you're at MSG. And when you don't have a real stone cold killer out there, like, you know, there, there's no way to keep up. And that was what I was kind of wondering throughout that game was, you know, it didn't happen until pretty late, like. Are the Knicks going to pull away at some point? And then, and even when they started to pull away, I'll give the Heat credit. Like Duncan Robinson hit a hit yeah. a big three late. You know, Struess had some big shots. Like the Heat never really went away. And I wanted to ask you guys something. Yeah, if I could, as far as and and, and EJ, you can start, and then Tommy, uh, you can take it from there. Because I talked a little bit earlier about kind of like the overconfidence from some Heat fans saying like we got the split we needed. Butler's coming back. We're still in great shape. Heat and five, all that stuff. Um, how do you guys feel from a Knicks standpoint, EJ? Like, did, were you a little bit frustrated with the idea that Butler didn't play a lot of people and they were, I think, 10 and a half point favorites, the Knicks, by the time the game tipped off, were you mm. a little bit disappointed by not running them out of the gym last night? And what do you think that says about the series? Yeah, it was highly frustrating. I was in the building and it was interesting. It was, it was a building that was a little tense, I would say, um, not the kind of, animal zoo kind of cry we've seen in these other playoff games and i think that the knicks fans kind of knew from the beginning once butler was out there was a lot of pressure on knicks to kind of dispatch this heat team very quickly and then once that did not happen i think the knicks team and the building all got really tense um i think it wasn't so much i think for me the frustrating that they didn't just blow them out on just in a vacuum it was the process to why they could not dispatch this team it was how poorly they were defensively um, the Heat have not been a great shooting team, but they've shot really well in these playoffs. And it seemed like there was like a lack of respect for the Heat's outside shooting, especially in a game where you know that you don't have Butler. So their one shot really is to launch as many threes as possible. I think that that was a frustrating part was that the Knicks should have kind of understood the game plan, understood the assignment, and it seemed like they did. And it kind of played around way too long in that game. So that was a frustrating part for me. And I think it does temper some of my expectations moving forward. I think a lot of Nick fans, it was very interesting. because I know you could probably speak to it as a Heat fan. Like I felt a lot of Nick fans, you know, saw the Heat beat the Bucks and said, oh, this is, you know, it was, uh, we're got, we got past the Eastern Conference Finals. And I think that Bucks fans, I mean, excuse me, uh, Heat fans probably saw the Knicks beat the Cavs and said, oh, well, this, is, this is great. Donovan Mitchell's out of the way. Now we got a path to the, to the Eastern Conference Finals. So I think that it, it kind of presents an interesting match. I think both 
kind of fan bases came in maybe a little uh, overconfident, having really kind of shocked the NBA world with both of their series wins. Maybe the Knicks not necessarily win, but being so dominant against Cleveland and Miami, both winning and dominating, but Milwaukee the way they did. So long answer, but yeah, I, I thought that the, the, the frustration was just the lack of focus for the Knicks in that game too. Yeah, I'll piggyback a little bit on EJ there. I thought the 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 process and the, the 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 way they got to that you know one possession game five minutes left was a little bit frustrating. Um, again, drop coverage, letting you know you knew the Heat going in had to hit a, a ton of three pointers in order to kind of hang around without Jimmy Butler in the game. But I didn't. I, I thought the spread was way too high without Butler. Listen, this this series, as you noted in the beginning, this series is going to be a rock fight. It's going to be ugly. It's going to be physical. Physical, um, whether Jimmy Butler's on the floor, whether Randall's on the floor, um, guys are going to get after it. The, the Heat are, you know, Spoh's one of, if not the best tactician in the NBA, one of the best. Um, and I thought going into game two, especially when Butler was ruled out, the pressure already, obviously, was already a must-win game for the Knicks. Now without Butler, the Heat could basically, were playing complete house money. Gabe Vincent yeah. and Max Struess and Duncan Robinson, who was you know had a poor game in game one. Those guys, worst case scenario, they get blown out. Hey, let's go have some dinner in, in Manhattan. Nobody yeah. expected us go to, to have Carbone with Aaron Rodgers. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, you know. Um, and I just thought that was kind of the vibe that the Heat could come in with it. Um, whereas the Heat, whereas the Knicks were playing with 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 a ton of pressure on them. Um, uh, Julie, uh, Randall obviously coming back first time he had played in a week looked to be moving around pretty well. Brunson nursing an ankle injury is a major concern. He looked, you know, only made one field goal, made his first three pointer in the corner um, in the first quarter, missed five in a row before halftime. So I thought there were definite cause for concern, not just with the score, but how it got there. Um, as you mentioned. Uh, you know, Hardenstein had a big impact in the second half. And then the and, you know, and the other thing about it, you know, you, you, you talked about how when Butler was out, the ball moved more freely. Randall coming back, the Knicks tends to, you know, move the ball a lot better. when Randall's not there to kind of eat up, you know, all the positives he brings to the table. Ball slows down a little bit. His obviously because Randall's usage rates is, is, is quite high. Um, you know, they got to work that back into the mix. So there's a lot of moving parts there. Um, but ultimately, at the end, uh, the Knicks, you know, with Brunson and, and Hart hitting those big clutch threes and, and Hartenstein getting offensive rebounds and setting screens, et cetera, was the difference. So, um, yeah, I listen, uh, as I wrote about uh, this morning, um, they don't call it a must win pretty game. They just call it a must win game. Um, <laughs> I like that. So I think that's kind of where the Nick fan, you know, should probably be thinking of it. You know, you lost game one, you had to split two. Now just go down to Miami, um, and hey, we got a five game series, Knicks versus Heat. I think we've uh, we've been there before. I forgot how it, I forgot how it turned out, but oh, well, don't ask, remind me about that. One. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it should be fun. One well, and, and it's funny you bring up that five game series because that that was one of the uh, the few times in in history that an eight seed took out a one. So I, I feel like the heat exercised that demon a little bit taken out mm. Milwaukee, right? Cause that was only the sixth time that ever happened. So it's like, yeah. it didn't make me forget about, about <laughs> that series against the Knicks, but it, uh, it softened the blow a little bit. Yeah. I think, I, I think the, the yeah, interesting ahead, thing for both these teams is there, you know, you talk about a clear path, not just to the Eastern conference finals now, but to the finals. I mean, the Celtics look infinitely vulnerable. Um, whatever's going on, they are obviously losing the game without Embiid. And now Embiid comes back, so we'll see if the Celtics can tie it up. Um, but can Embiid stay healthy? And either team would have to like their chances uh, against the Sixer-less, uh, Embiid-less Sixer team. So we'll see how that plays out. But um, so many interesting storylines, but that's one of them. There's, you know, heading into game three, the, sh the pressure shifts a little bit back to Miami. But I think both teams recognize Guys, there's a significant opportunity to make some noise here. And real quickly, before I ask uh, uh, how you see this series playing out, as a longtime Heat fan, you know, I've, it's funny, I feel like Tony's probably annoyed about it because I've, I've talked so much about this Nick Heat rivalry and, and talked about the favorite memories I had as a Nick fan during the rivalry. And I'm curious, as a Heat fan, what is your favorite memory from the Knicks Heat rivalry? Like, I know, like, you know, the Knicks won a lot of those series. So, you know, we have a lot of thoughts of them winning but from a heat fans perspective I mean, you guys had some big wins you yeah. won in 97 like, listen, what, listen what's, 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 before you answer we we don't say pj brown's name on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> that limits my options a little bit but <laughs> in, in, in that in that series when there was like a melee going on on the court i i recall uh jeff van gundy like clinging to alonzo morning's leg it's like one of my one of my favorite snapshots yeah. and that was 
and, and that 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 was just such it was it was pandemonium like that 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 series the end of that it was just so crazy and so wild i was like uh, i think i was the seventh or eighth grader at the time and that that just got me so pumped for playoff basketball and that that's always what it should be you know i'm mm. sure the the final scores of those games were like in the 80s and in the 90s at most it was it was just so much more physical back then and there just there seemed to be like you know i'm sure there was a professional admiration but there seemed to just be like a like a hatred between those yeah. two teams and those fan bases which yeah everyone's too nice these days you don't get nearly as much of that but <laughs> Yeah, it was that that series for me because, you know, in most of those late 90s series, the Knicks would end up getting the better of Miami. That that was the one time where it's like, OK, we got this one. And, and that name that we shall not speak uh, was <laughs> certainly a big part of that. Yeah, it's funny. And like being in seventh, eighth grade, that's a great time because like I, I always talk about how I was like eight or nine years old, you know, between like eight and 11, I guess, during those runs. And that's kind of when you first really kind of grow your love for the NBA. Like, I think that's a great time and I'm happy I lived during that time and that series happened. But I think if there was a second time I could say when I wanted to, when would I have wanted to be in terms of age during that series? I think like that's the perfect time. But that's when like now, like all you care about is sports probably. All you care about is that stuff. So you're like fully invested and it's everything that, that, that means the world to you. So that's an awesome time to kind of be around watching those, uh, those classic games. Yeah, no, no, no doubt. What, what about you guys? I'm, I'm sure that that specific series was probably not the one you would pinpoint. <laughs> oh, no. So, no, no, no. Where, where do you guys go? Yeah, I, I mean, I was Alan Houston is shot at hanging up in my, in my. Oh, room. see that, so. see that, that I think on Red Hot Hoops, I'm gonna ban that name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry, but yeah, that that Alan Houston shot. I mean, you know, that was the shot. I'd never forget where I was in my living room. You know, had to call my dad on his terrible cell phone to tell him what happened. It was this, you know, this is 1999. So he has one of the first ever cell phones, probably. Yeah, that was definitely by far the, the, the number one for me. Yeah, I think uh, the Houston shot is, uh, you know, in Knicks lore. Looks in the that's probably the last big shot, big moment the Knicks have had. You know, in, in, in the, the the 21st century has not been kind to uh, the franchise. So uh, yeah, I think we got to go with uh, Allen. I'll ball. tell you another one, another one for me, in a little bit more of a modern era. And and you know, this this was uh, you know the whole when, when the Heat stomped out Lynn Sanity, and when uh, <laughs> I yeah. think it was I think it was the same series when Amari Stoudemire, who would end up he would end up being on the Heat later in his career when he, he smashed the uh, the fire extinguisher oh, in yeah. frustration that was uh, they, they, they were trolling him for years yes. down yeah. in Miami about that yeah I had so much hope for that series too because like you know Lynn had got hurt so he didn't play yeah that's right but the Knicks were playing so well up until that point and then they just got smoked in game one and they lost by like 100 points in game one and I was like <laughs> oh this and then Mari breaks his hand or hurts his hand cuts his you know cuts his hand and, and the series is over so yeah, bad memories there, but uh, it's nonetheless, you know, this is why uh, this rivalry is so awesome because you got both sides have their uh, their bragging rights, and um, someone's gonna be right here. Someone's gonna be bragging after this series. But uh, Alex Dono, you got to make sure you catch Red Hot Hoops Miami Heat podcast, Odyssey Sports Network. Catch all of his work also uh, covering the Miami Hurricanes as well. Locked on Canes, Alex. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Dude, it's my pleasure, and, and guys, hopefully we, we can do this again, maybe uh, in this series, because uh, again, yep. I, I I think it's I think it's probably going to go seven, so we'll, we'll see. I think we agree. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, guys. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more content like this. If you want to see more of our videos, be sure to check out our playlist and let us know what you think in the comments below. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date on our latest podcast ventures. Um, links will be in the descriptions. And as always, thanks for watching, and we will see you in our next video.